you ask yourself this, would Sister Lucy, if she had this mandate from Our Lady, would she allow this? October 11th, look at that day. October 11th, 1968, 1962, 57 years ago to the day, today, John the 23rd opens the Second Vatican Council and makes his infinite remarks denouncing the prophets of doom. Who are the prophets of doom? Our Lady of Fatima, Sister Lucy. Uh, look at another date, connecting Vatican II to Fatima and the miracle of the sun. October 13th, 1962, marked the first initial working session of the council. We're in members of the top 10 concil conciliar commissions were elected. So it all, Vatican II actually begins on October 13th, 1962. Okay, let's summarize what we've come to historically speaking. Sister Lucy, not publicly seen again. Okay, so that was 1957. She gave that interview. Sister Lucy was not publicly seen again until May 13th, 1967, on the 50th anniversary of Fatima with Paul VI. Striking, strikingly, in her 1967 appearance, before the world, Sister Lucy, look at quotes. Now we're going to put in the little quotes. Sister Lucy appeared jovial and in good health, even gesturing to the crowd, cheering crowd, as if prodding them for more adulation. You wait and see the picture. I don't, I, I just have to text, I have to look on the internet and text my friend. What's it called? Raising the roof? What's it called? It's a movement like... Well, I gotta do this. Like this. And then if she started, like, throwing a softball up in the air, like, up, you know, like, raise your enthusiasm. Shout out even more. <laughs> um... Yeah, well, I'm going to show you that in a moment. But uh, so that happens 1967. Look what happens 1968. All these years, one after another, Paul VI changed the right of uh, consecration and ordination, promulgates the new mass. Now look at this. We have this letter. We have this letter. We've analyzed this letter. December 27th, 1969. Sister Lucy writes a strongly worded letter demanding complete obedience to Paul VI. Take a, well, you think that's going to be authentic, huh? You do. Here she is. You, well, she's there. This is her raising the roof motion of, you know, cheerleading getting the crowd all riled up for Paul VI. Give me a break. Can you, well, I can't go back to the other one. Can you imagine? Then, the strange interview in 1992 and 1993. Just one thing about this interview. Both interviews were on October 11th. October 11th, 1992, and October 11th, 1993. It was with Carlos Evaristo, and it's videotaped. You can see it on the internet. You can see it on YouTube. What do you think she's going to say? Punishment is imminent. Do penance. Russia uh, should be converted. Wrong. This is what she said in that interview. You can see her saying it on tape. It was taped. 
The third secret, this is her. The third secret was not supposed to be revealed in 1960. The secret was meant only for the Pope and not the public. Russia did not need to be mentioned by name in the consecration. Uh, yeah, consecration. Heaven has accepted John Paul II's 1984 consecration. The Jews continue to be a chosen people of God. The triumph of the Immaculate Heart has already taken place. But it's an ongoing process, so it just doesn't seem like it. Okay, go. <laughs> After you get off the hill, you pretty much see it's very ongoing, yeah. Um, but I've, it's on YouTube. You have to see it. She's at the, this mass for the beatification of Jacinta and Francisco. And this is her receiving communion from John Paul II, 2000. As soon as, first of all, she goes up, she goes up when he's giving her the host, he, she goes up to grab his hand, almost like she's used to receiving communion in the hand. And he has to sort of insert it in her mouth strongly. And then, immediately after she gets communion, she starts kissing the hand of John Paul II. And then she asked her bodyguard if she could stay next to John Paul II on the altar while he was giving out communion. For the woman who received the blessed sacrament from an angel who prostrated himself on the ground? In the same year, she had an interview with John Paul II that was taped. She held his hand for two hours during that interview. Summary of historical evidence. Warning from Our Lady that Lucia's life was in danger and would be in the future. A cascade of events bringing the late, 19, bringing the late 1950s and the early 60s into sharp focus. Multiple sources announcing the third secret to be released in 1960. Powerful 1957 interview with Father Fuentes, and which was denied thereafter by the Diocese of Coimbra. Direct connection between Fatima and the first working session of Vatican II, and multiple inconsistencies in Sister Lucia's behavior and statements post-1967. Now, photographic evidence. Here we go. We, now, when you, what we did, we have over a hundred pictures of Sister Lucy from one time or another. We divided them up into four categories. The A category, which is Sister Lucy as a child. The B category, which is Sister Lucy in the 1920s, 1940s, early 50s. Excuse me, that's the B category. The C category is Sister Lucy on that one day, May 13th in 1967, when she was in Fatima. So that's sub subject C. Then subject D is post-1981, when John Paul II went to see her, all right, those pictures after 1981. Who did we consult? We consulted two board-certified plastic surgeons. We consulted periodontists. We consulted with... Uh, 
a criminal forensic sketch artist, and I'll talk about her in a moment. We consulted four different facial recognition companies in this endeavor. One of them is Amazon. One, of, no, actually five. We did five. Amazon, uh, Microsoft, and then um, we consulted one that uh, works with the government of China who are really into facial recognition software. And, um, well, I think <laughs> they, they want to locate, they want to identify people, so... And then we have an ophthalmologist. That information is the, released here for the first time. Okay, so what's the, what's the evidence? Expert analysis of photographs. First one, the plastic surgeon, Dr. Julio Garcia, board certified in plastic surgery by the American Board of Plastic Surgeons, a member of the American Academy of Cosmetic Surgery, a member of the American Society of Aesthetic Plastic Surgery, Chief of Plastic Surgery at both Humana Sunrise and Valley Hospitals. He also has an art degree from Northwestern University, and he's on the American Board of Anti-Aging. I wonder what that is. <laughs> okay, we bring you his conclusion first. He saw all the pictures, and he pointed out things to us that we didn't even see, and we had to follow up on. He says this. He never heard of this case before. He ne we, he just looking at the evidence. I am of the opinion that Subject B, 1940s Sister Lucy, and Subject C, 1967 Sister Lucy, share some similarities, but I am very confident they are not the same individual. Finding number one, inconsistent chin. Now I think you can see the chins, right? Same person? Same person? Can you see? Sort of? You got to see this. Come over here. Sit over here. <laughs> You got to see these chins. Every single specialist going, the chin, the chin, the chin, the chin. And nobody thinks for some reason that Sister Lucy had a chin implant. Nobody. <laughs> All right? It seems a little odd. Yeah. Finding inconsistent chins, visibly different chins, unexplainable except the individuals are different, or a chin implant. <laughs> Subject C and D, that's 1967 and after, okay? Subject C and D have far more prominent protrusive chins when compared to the profile view of Subject B on top, the real Sister Lucy. The difference cannot be explained by the aging process, nor can dental work account for the observed discrepancy. As we age, we lose fat and bone, making the appearance of the chin less prominent over time. The chin and jaw will not be altered in the manner apparent in the image and video with usual dental work it would have to be a broken jaw bones or f broken facial bones. <laughs> there you go. You can see that? Nope. Same person, right? Why have they been saying it's the same person for so long? Here we go. Uh, I can't see too well, but the real uh, Sister Lucy on top, then below. Same thing. Here we go, side by side, profile view. This is, these are the photos that the plastic surgeon picked out. Here we go again, 
two Sister Lucy twos on the bottom, and then the one Sister Lucy on the top. Now, okay, here we go. I bet you never thought about eye, eyelid creases. Or <laughs> I better put this down. Um, you, wanna, you always want to know about eyelid creases? Okay. <laughs> here, here is, um, you see, you see eyelid crease here? No. You see eyelid crease here? Yes. Look what he says. This is quoting from his report to us. It would be very unusual to not be able to detect a crease in the upper lid when an individual is young and then observe such a crease when that same individual ages. However, in images from the 1940s, it is nearly impossible to detect any crease in the upper eyelid. Yet, in the post-1967 photos, the upper lid crease is observable in nearly every photograph. Here we go again. You see up there is the first one. Sister Lucy 2 is on the bottom. This is 1967 over there, and this is 1999 over here. You see? Here we go again. This is, you got to really look, but it's uh, eyelid crease here. Eyelid crease here. Remember, it doesn't become from age, the aging process. Okay, plastic surgeon's report, finding. Finding number three, different eyebrow distances. Some of you noticed this already. The distance between the eyebrow and eye should shorten with age, not lengthen. So this is the 1940s Sister Lucy over there, and this is... The 1967 Sister Lucy, 20 years later. In Sister Lucy 2, the distance is longer. Mathematical measuring of the faces establishes ratios that show Sister Lucy 1 has a substantially shorter distance between the bottom of the brow to the upper eyelid, eyelash, when compared to Lucy 2. Okay, and the mathematical measurements that we're giving you has never before been published by us, so you hear it for the first time. So you see it gets bigger when it's supposed to get smaller. How can this be? Okay, these are the different ratios. Um, and when it goes beyond the realm of uh, normal standard deviation, it goes yellow and red. <laughs> so here's the original Sister Lucy, and there's the statistics, the numberings for the new Sister Lucy. And you see the standard deviations way above the mean or below. I mean, just look at some of these numbers, and you see these, like... 6.42, uh, where's this, where's the mean? 6.04, uh, 9.98, 5.84, uh, 5.166, 4.5, 9, wait, no. 7.8, 5.8. This is mathematics. It's not feeling. It's not theology. It's mathematics, which has implications for everything. Okay, he continues. The width of the nose of subject C and D appears wide relative to the mouth when compared to the nose and mouth of subject B. Okay, you see the wide nose of Sister Lucy 2. 
mathematical measuring of the faces establishes ratios that show Sister Lucy 1 has more a more narrow nose than Sister Lucy 2. When calculating the ratio of the width of the nose relative to the mouth and the interpulpiary distance, width of nose is unaffected by aging or maturity. So the width of the nose doesn't change with aging or maturity. So therefore, why the mathematical differences? And here's the statistics. You can see all the red and the orange and the beyond the standard deviation. Okay, photographic anomalies. So you'll love this one. This is what Dr. Garcia pointed out to us and we started looking into it and doing research. An unexpected insight during Dr. Garcia's analysis concerned a photograph. I'll show you it in a moment. At least one of the images appears to have been tampered with or otherwise altered. Specifically, subject C, exhibit six, presents an image of subject C, that's the 1967 Lucy, that is incompatible with the lighting present in the remainder of the image. This is what he said. What do you think about that? Doesn't it appear, doesn't she appear odd? Just sort of awkwardly appearing there? What do you think? Someone say something. Out of place. Out of place? See, she seems out of place. She doesn't seem to be reacting to him, and he doesn't seem to be reacting to her, really. Notice the people in the background. He's looking, he's man the glasses. Look at this. What do you think this is? It's a camera. Why would Sister Lucy be sitting and standing in front of the camera? This is the most famous picture from the 1967 meeting between Sister Lucy and Paul VI. This picture, and it was published on June 13th, 1967, one month after the event. Look in. Okay. Okay. This is perhaps the most widely published. Okay, good. That's the newspaper that it appeared in. That's the picture. Okay. This is, that was the newspaper, the Vos de Fatima. That was the newspaper produced by the shrine at Fatima. Whoa, what happened to Sister Lucy? She isn't really there. This is the source photo. You see the man with the glasses? You see the man turning? And then you see the camera being man, say man with the glasses. All right, man in the background. Is the lady in the background? Yeah, she's here. And then she's here. And then, boom, right in front of the camera appears Sister Lucy. The photographic anomalies multiplied as the examination continued. That's an understatement. Okay, wow, look at this. Sister Lucy, talking very closely, intimately, friend, in a friendly way with Paul VI. All right, this huge crowd in the background. Notice this flag here, and notice the various characters, this man back here. And uh, this man with the handkerchief here. Uh, so they're talking, laughing. Who thinks that's real? Guess what? Nope. Let's go. That's the source photo. That's the real photo. And then this photo was put out. See the flags? The same position. What is it? The man with his back turned? Same position. 
and look at, he's in exactly the same position. They've done something, look at a little deviousness here. They've done something with his sleeve here, so that it seems to drape over Sister Lucy a slight bit. But, uh, it's not here. She, she wasn't there. You know how long she spent with him? Three minutes. On that day in 1967. Three minutes. Well, we got another one. Whoa. Will to decide. Okay, not perfectly normal, right? Look at the look at the figures. What do you think about Sister Lucy? Remember that face? Bef remember that picture before? It's the same one. It's the same one that was on that book. It was the same one in the yearbook. The same one in, near the camera. Do you think that looks real? I well. Oh boy. Okay, and, well, there's she in front of the camera again, and they manipulate the background a little bit, you see, but she has exactly the same expression on. We still aren't sure regarding how these were made because there was no um, uh, Photoshop in those days. And my friend is looking into this because clearly the, the face of Sister Lucy was tampered with. Okay, the eye positions are strange. You can't really see it here. Uh, they, they turn the image this way and that to try to make it look plausible. I'm just going to... Then there's the uh, floating eyebrow. You can't really see it. They manipulated this image so much. There's a floating eyebrow here that you can see with some technical equipment. I don't know if you can see it. You see the eyebrow coming out here slightly. It's a, a floating eyebrow. <laughs> Something's happening to that picture. Okay, here we go again. Can you see the floating eyebrow here? Yeah. Notice, same picture. Okay, let's get to the same picture. Oh, there she is again. Uh, my friend is, I mean, he's really analyzing this picture. Uh, okay, here we go. There's strange things with the eyes going on. You, you see there's this bit of flesh right here. Uh, uh, the flesh seems to go into the eye right here, showing there's a, it seems like there's an attempt to age the figure. You can see it better uh, over here. You see that bit of flesh going into the eye? It looks really strange. Okay, and just to show you, okay, okay, I'm gonna go fast. Okay, we'll skip by the dentist. No one likes to hear from a dentist anyways. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, dentist, yeah, blah. same thing, chins. Okay, uh, forensic artist report. Lois Gibson, she ha she's in the Guinness Book of World Records for, for identifying the most criminals through her sketches. She recreates faces even from skulls. All right, she is the top uh, forensic artist in the world. And she, this is what she said when she did a report. She said, every one of these forensic reports is a complete confirmation of, our, of the thesis. I could have done many more. Any one of the three is conclusive. So I sense this is totally convincing. Okay, Gibson says that the two sister Lucys have completely different facial structures, and therefore it is impossible these are the same woman. And uh, she goes through the uh, comparisons. And I think there's, okay, here. She, based on her pictures from childhood, Sister Lucy's, and from the 1940s, that's uh, how she was supposed to look, according to this biometrics and all this. Uh, 1960 makes sense. That's how she actually looked. This is how she's supposed to look at 80? 
This is how she looks at 84. Then we have facial recognition, then we have facial recognition reports, and it says, okay, the, the, the conclusion of it all, this is from Michigan State University, the only university that has a forensic um, a facial recognition lab. Subjects A and B are one individual. That's the child and the, um, the 1940s sister Lucy. C and D are very likely also the same individual. B, the real sister Lucy, is different from subject D, the elderly sister Lucy. Okay. And this is, he identified another um, facial recognition report. He identified, this one identified the um, Boston Marathon bombers. And he says, uh, facial analysis strongly suggests that subject B, the real sister Lucy, and subject C are photographs from two different individuals. Different nose lengths, different philtrum length, different eyebrow shapes, different mouth shapes. And here are all the statistics. This is his facial recognizer, okay? People have, some people have the ability, some people forget faces as soon as they see them. Some people have an extraordinary ability to remember and identify and analyze faces. Well, this woman is ranked the number one super recognizer in Australia. She's part of a whole, uh, she's cutting edge research at the University of New South Wales. And she was ranked number one in facial recognition. She's a super recognizer, okay? And what did she say? And she sorted the pictures herself out. She concluded that the first two were the same person, child in 1940s, and the latter two displayed a different person. And then we have the ophthalmologist. Just one more thing here. Um, so we wanted an ophthalmologist to analyze our material. So he said, oh, okay, I have an international conference of 20 of the best ophthalmologists in the entire world coming here to New York, so I'm going to present it to them. So they, he presented the Sister Lucy problem to these world-class ophthalmologists. And you, um, strabis, strabismus, you know what strabismus is? Lazy eye, right? Lazy eye. You can't, surgery can, uh, you can't, it doesn't go, it doesn't fix itself. Well, it ends up where the majority, the supermajority of strabismus experts said the pre-1967 Sister Lucy does have strabismus, lazy eye syndrome. You see the, uh, her right eye is deviated, her right eye. And then the other one, according to the supermajority of strabismus experts, the post-Sister Lucia does not have strabismus. And it doesn't get better with age. Okay? And medical treatments for this condition were not available during the relevant time frames applicable to Sister Lucia. Finally, handwriting evidence. Okay. We presented hundreds of pages of hand, handwriting evidence to one of the best handwriting analysts in the world, and um, can I just point out these, some of these things? Guess what he says? Not only the pictures, he didn't even look at the pictures, but get, he said all the letters, all the signatures post-1960 were forgeries. Based on the hundreds and hundreds of pages he had looked at, from the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s, Sister Lucy. Okay, I want to point out, this is the third secret of Fatima. This is something I wasn't expecting to find. He says the secret uh, released by the Vatican was authentic. 
probably, you know, in her handwriting, probably meaning there's more to it. Uh, this is just the vision. There's probably more to it. And that's a mystery that we haven't, we're not going to solve. Um, okay. Well, look at this. Can I just do you a little S's here? Oh, wait. Okay, the S's. I'll get to it. Okay, here we go. Oh, no, the H's. Do you notice anything, Sherlock's? <laughs> this is the uh, question, Sister Lucy. This is the, no. Anything different with the H's? Here's the line. Here's the line. So your H's, what do they do? They consistently go below the line. They consistently, over and over again, go below, go below the line, the H's. Look at here. Look at the new sister Lucy's writings. Is that below the line? That's above the line. Is that below the line? That's on the line. On the, above the line. Above the line. Below, below. Okay, just the S's. Same S's. Hook. Real Sister Lucy. Hook. These are different samples. Hook. Hook. Look at here. No hook. No hook. No hook. No hook. No hook. No hook. The, the letters from 1967, 1969, 1980 were all forgeries. Okay, in summary, but it's a clever hoax. It's a clever forgery. In summary, there are some similar strokes to the known writings of Irma Lucia that would be expected if the intent of the writer was to model or copy the writer's style of handwriting. Like all forged documents, the small micro movements and the connections of the pen often reveal details and errors that are not part of the natural writer's execution. In this case, the differences are significant and point to a different writer than the known writer Irma Lucia. There's her difference. There's her signatures. Same. That's the early one, 1940s. That's 1967, 1969. You see the differences? The loops and all that. Okay, let's just, we'll conclude this. The post-1960 writings are definitely by a different hand. These are his conclusions. A significant noticeable discrepancy arises in 1967 and every sample thereafter. Notice the 1969 letter, forgery, demands obedience to Paul VI. Timeline of discrepancy in handwriting matches perfectly with discrepancies in the historical and photographic evidence. What is the best explanation? Another person was posing as Sister Lucy. <laughs> Sherlock, when you have eliminated all which is impossible, then whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Okay, so this is uh, what you can do. Um, we're not finished. We're going after documents. We're going after some more reports. And we're going to go after the DNA. I'm not supposed to say that, but don't tell anyone. It's not going to be easy. Uh, pray for us if you can contribute to our tax-deductible effort. Uh, please do. Let's not let this sit. This is an abomination. 
Let's get justice for dear sister Lucy because we owe her that, the true messenger of God and Our Lady. Thank you so much for your attention.